Thank you very much for coming out uh, <clears throat> on a Friday night at the uh, kind of end of a very, very long week for many of us. Um, I think it's actually very appropriate that Zachary's going to be talking about the issue of ground. Uh, as many of us may have feel like the ground has been pulled out from under our feet this week. Um, and, you know, just the questions of what what is ground? What is that fundament upon which we build, upon which we as architects construct our structures, um, upon which we as theoreticians construct our discourse? Um, it's something that I think really uh, is applicable to the, uh, the context within which I had the pleasure to meet Zachary Tate Porter. <laughs> Um, I was thinking a subtitle for this little intro could be Conversations Over Coffee, thinking about Sylvia Levin's provocation of conversations over cocktails. Instead, Zachary and I embarked upon uh, 15 weeks, 14 weeks of uh, 10 a.m. coffee in hand, semi-darkened room with 70 eager students uh, to discuss contemporary architecture and theory um, in the context of a class we taught together. And I think that series of conversations um, really, I, I learned so much about Zachary during those conversations. Um, I learned of his profound uh, respect for the work of John Hayduck, his particular view of that work and how that could be understood within some of the contemporary work on, on figuration and posture and such issues that, that goes on at places uh, like here at SciArc. Um, and I also learned how to think about the Villa Rotunda in a completely different way, um, how it engaged with its site, with its ground, the difference between the ground, the site, um, the way in which we might consider those issues uh, to rethink how we appropriate um, architecture, how we bring it into a canon, and how we value, attach value to it, or how we dismiss and do not attach value to certain things. Um, it's also, uh, this is the subject of, a, of a, an essay that Zachary contributed to the um, SciArc's online journal Off-Ramp, The Useless Issue, um, which I would really encourage you to read. Behind me is the slide of the issue Ground, which was edited by Zachary during his uh, 2015 2016 uh, tenure as the SciArc uh, Design of Theory Fellow. Um, and I think I'm confident he'll speak more about that tonight. Um, and with that, I'll just say, you know, just a few words, the more formal side of this um, that uh, Zachary's practice really spans between being an educator, a designer, and an historian. Um, something that we really value in the Design of Theory Fellowship, someone who is not only operating in terms of producing discourse, but someone who's also producing architecture, producing design. Um, so Zach's uh, PhD dissertation is entitled Shifting Grounds of Architectural Practice, Boundary Conditions, and Field Formations in the U.S. Design Professions. Um, and this dissertation I just learned is going to be uh, defended in March, so we look forward to seeing that published. Um, and uh, the dissertation analyzes the ways in which professional jurisdiction shaped conceptions of landscape and site within American architectural practice during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so in addition to editing uh, off-ramps. Uh, Zachary's work has been featured in gallery exhibitions, art magazines, and online publications such as Draftery and Better Magazine. And Zachary is currently teaching uh, across town at the, at the University of Southern California School of Architecture. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome Zachary Tate Porter. Thank you. Thanks, Marceline, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be back here at SciArc, where I served as the Design of Theory Fellow last year. And I must say, it was an incredibly uh, pleasurable experience to teach alongside such thoughtful educators, many of whom are here tonight, 
as well as to work with an immensely talented body of students. Uh, it's, there's an energy in this place that I've not experienced at any other institution, so it's a special place. And I'm also grateful to Hernan Diaz Alonso, as well as the rest of the leadership for being so warm and welcoming. But most of all, I owe the biggest debt of gratitude, I think, to Marcel and Gao, who oversaw the Design of Theory Fellowship during my time here. Her support and generosity really meant a lot, so thank you. So what I want to talk about tonight is some of my research on ground. I've titled this talk, Cuts and Fills, Constructing a Discourse on Ground. And this is a subject that I've been working on for the past five or six years through a variety of approaches. So part of what I'm going to argue tonight is that architectural research can be multimodal. It can be a combination of historical analysis, curation, teaching, and even design. And so what I want to do is uh, give a brief introduction to, to who I am and what I do. I was initially trained as an architect. I have a bachelor's in architectural design as well as a master's in architectural design. And then after that, I pursued a PhD in architectural history. So I'm not an architect who's actively de designing buildings or anything like that. But nonetheless, design operates as a critical mode of thinking within my work. And I'm particularly interested in the ways in which history might rub up against contemporary design agendas. And that's what I'm going to be testing out here tonight. So as Marcelin mentioned, uh, while I was here at SIRC last year, I engaged in three primary activities. Uh, first, I was the editor for this journal, Off Ramp, which is the school's online journal here at SIRC. And in this capacity, I oversaw the publication of Issue 11, which focused on the theme of ground. And so I think of editing not just as the editing of text, but as the curation of themes, the solicitation of contributions. So editing in its broadest sense is how I took on this task. At the same time, I was teaching a seminar entitled Theories of Ground. And this seminar uh, investigated the conundrum of why some buildings might hover above the earth, while others sit directly on it, and still others bury into the ground. And so we asked in this seminar, uh, what kinds of conceptual frameworks, what kinds of ideological structures might underlie these various approaches to the, the relationship between building and ground? And finally, in addition to editing the journal and teaching this seminar, I was also doing my own scholarly research. So this included a dissertation from Georgia Tech, which, as Marcelin mentioned, is in the final stages of completion, I'm happy to report, but also standalone papers such as this one, entitled Contested Terrain, which was presented at ACSA in Seattle. And for the most part, my research and writing focuses on professional jurisdiction as a lens for looking at the relationship between building and ground. So as you've probably already realized, these three different activities of editing, teaching, and writing were all directed towards the same topic, ground. And so what I'm going to try to do tonight is to weave together these parallel lines of research into a single narrative that begins to present an emergent discourse on ground. In order to do that, I'm going to start with a series of historical narratives for my dissertation work that focus on specific moments of jurisdictional conflict between architects and other design professionals. So as you see here, we'll talk about the National Mall, as well as the Hetch Hetchy Canyon in Yosemite National Park, and then a couple of overlapping narratives about uh, the development of Los Angeles. Then I want to talk about an exercise we did in my seminar, Theories of Ground, in which we were trying to unpack the divergent terminologies that related to ground. So looking at these terms and asking what differences might exist between them, what categories can be formed to group them. And from there, I want to conclude by letting these historical and theoretical projects fold back onto contemporary design agendas. And to do that, I want to highlight two contributions in particular from the off-ramp journal that I edited. That is, an interview I did with Tom Wiscom on his work, as well as a spring studio taught here by Florencia Pita. And the idea really throughout the night is going to be to test the ways in which historical and theoretical research can rub against or fold back onto contemporary issues within design. But first, I want to start with this guy. Does anyone know who this character is? I'll give you $20 if someone can tell me who that is. This is uh, Morris Hickey Morgan, who was a professor of classical philology at Harvard at the turn of the 20th century. And during the last years of his life, during the last years of his career as well, 
he turned his attention to the task of translation. In particular, he began to translate Vitruvius into English. Now, of course, there were already existing translations of Vitruvius in English, but he really wanted to perfect the language of the text. He wanted to make Vitruvius as accessible as possible to American readers. When he died in 1910, he had finished all except for one chapter, and so a few of his Harvard colleagues came together and they completed the text and published it posthumously in 1914. So if any of you have read Vitruvius in English, in all likelihood, then you've read Morgan's translation. And what you find within Vitruvius' treatise is an expansive view of architectural jurisdiction. Matters ranging from the construction of buildings, to the grading of topography, to the cultivation of the natural environment, all fall under the architect's control. All of these things belong to the purview of the architect. And what I would like to suggest is this decision to return to Vitruvius at the turn of the 20th century, the dawn of the modern era, uh, at least within architecture, can be read as a search for origins, looking for the origins of architectural practice and looking to this fundamental text, the first treatise ever written on architecture. But what will be critical for us all to remember tonight is that origin stories are never really about the past at all. In fact, origin stories always say more about the present than the past. And so in this interpretation, the return to Vitruvius could be said to reflect an anxiety, an anxiety about the status of the architect within modern society. And in fact, if you were an architect working in the United States at the turn of the 20th century, there was good reason to be anxious. All of the myriad responsibilities of the Vitruvian architect were being subdivided. They were being split across four professions. These were civil engineering, landscape architecture, architecture, and city planning. This distribution of expertise was even evident on Harvard's campus, where each discipline was getting its own degree program. So for instance, in the mid-19th century, if you were a student at Harvard who wanted to be an architect, you most likely would have been studying within the Lawrence Scientific School, alongside engineers. And many famous architects did this. H.H. H. Richardson, William Robert Ware, they studied in the Lawrence Scientific School. It's not until the later years of the 19th century that architecture gets its own degree program, followed by landscape architecture and then city planning in 1923. And so I've always found it a bit ironic that Morris Hickey Morgan was working on his translation of Vitruvius, this text in which the architect does everything, at the very same time that these disciplines are splitting off from one another, even, within, even on the campus of Harvard. And in many ways, this distribution of design expertise across the four professions is entirely consistent with broader trends towards specialization that affected nearly every aspect of American life during the 19th and early 20th centuries. But what I would suggest is that this division of labor also created problems where none had existed before. It fueled tensions between these professions as they competed over jurisdictions for practice. And in actuality, the tension between the professions comes to the forefront when one considers the relationship between building and ground. There are certain aspects of architectural and urban production that can be neatly compartmentalized within one profession or another, but the integration of a building into its immediate site and its surrounding landscape relies on the structured coordination among several experts who each hold one piece to the larger puzzle. Yet, as you can probably imagine, the collaboration and coordination did not come so naturally to design professionals during the early 20th century. And instead, the ground became a locus of intense jurisdictional competition. So I always like to show these paintings by Stephen Novo when I talk about this issue of jurisdiction. He's an Australian painter, and these were in fact published within issue 11 of Off Ramp as well that I edited. And what I like about them is that they really illustrate this coexistence of contradictory constructions of ground. You have the flat concrete porch that clearly belongs to the house sitting atop this brick foundation, and all of that sitting on this other horizontal plane, and then that's all sitting on this undulating surface which has its own structural framework. And then that is all sitting on another horizontal plane with this little patch of grass in the front. So, uh, what, so what I think that shows is that the different ways in which jurisdictional competition exists, who gets to design the ground, under what circumstances, and how do they design it?
There's a whole series of these paintings that are up on the website, uh, on the online journal uh, off-ramp, so you should really go check them out. But this question of jurisdiction has been at the center of my research and writing. And so I want to give you an idea of why I think it's important and how it played out in the early 20th century through a couple of examples. But first, before we can go to the examples, I think we have to ask what jurisdiction really is. This is a text from a sociologist named Andrew Abbott, who's written extensively on the subject. And I think his definition of jurisdiction is as good as any I've come across. He says, the central phenomenon of professional life is the link between a profession and its work, a link that I shall call jurisdiction. To analyze professional development is to analyze how this link is created in work, how it is anchored by formal and informal social structure, and how the interplay of jurisdictional links between professions determines the history of individual professions themselves. So what's going on here? He's saying two things. On the one hand, he's defining jurisdiction as this link between a profession and its work. But then he does something else, something I think that's more, even, pro more provocative even than that. He suggests that jurisdiction is a theoretical model that can be used to study the development of professions. So he says, the interplay of jurisdictional links between professions determines the history of the individual professions themselves. And you have to understand how provocative this idea really is within sociology. So conventionally, professions are analyzed like this. You have a band of practitioners who come together, and they start marching towards this state of professional maturity. And they do so through a series of professional milestones. When sociologists talk about this, a milestone might be something like establishing an organization, like the AIA, or it could be instituting licensure requirements, or creating educational pathways and university degree programs, or even founding a professional journal. And the idea is that through these milestones, through a series of sequential stages of development, you end in a state of professional maturity. And when the profession is mature, it's able to exert its influence upon society to the greatest effect. But Andrew Abbott throws all this out the window, and he suggests instead that it's the moments of jurisdictional overlap and competition that guide the development of each profession. And so in this model, there is no state of absolute maturity. Each of the allied professions is constantly changing in relationship to the others. My own research analyzes how this dynamic of jurisdictional competition and overlap played out within the design professions during the first decades of the early 20th century. And one of the ways that I've studied this dynamic is to look at conference proceedings and professional journals from the period in order to see how architects talk about their competitors. So I'll give you an example. Here is a report from the 1905 AIA conference where one architect is objecting even to the title of landscape architect. It says, Mr. Seeler, who is an architect, called forth an applause of the convention by his objection to the term landscape architect as applied to those who lay out the grounds and planting around a house. Such a calling is not, strictly speaking, architecture and is admittedly obscurely named, but we are inclined to doubt whether a better title is likely to be found. The modern landscapist is certainly not a gardener. He is certainly also not an architect, and he really has less to do often with the landscape as such than the architect himself. So rather than amiable collaboration, there was a certain degree of hostility between architects and landscape architects, as well as civil engineers and city planners. Each profession was concerned with defining and defending its own professional turf. And these battle lines between the professions were constantly shifting and reconfiguring depending on the context. So I want to show a few examples of how these jurisdictional dynamics influence practice during this period. And one area of intense jurisdictional competition was the National Mall. Now, of course, the idea of the National Mall was first presented in LaFont's plan for DC, and it was actually upon the request of Thomas Jefferson that he put the mall there. And so here you see LaFont's plan, and at the center, that white strip of ground uh, going from the Capitol towards the west would be the National Mall. But throughout the 19th century, the mall was not comprehensively designed as a landscape. Even though LaFont had put it in his plan, it was not executed, at least not immediately. There were buildings that extended across the axis, there were trees, even a railroad. The properties on either side didn't align. Here's another representation where you can, if you look closely, see that railroad that cuts directly across the center of the National Mall 
during the 19th century. And so it's not until 1899 that the AIA uh, starts a movement to redesign the mall. And they're doing this as a celebration of the centennial anniversary of moving the capital from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. And here is the team of two architects and a landscape architect that are in charge of designing it. And here is one of the renderings uh, that st might start to look more familiar to you as the National Mall. You can see there's an axis that's created between the Washington Monument and the Capitol building, flanked by trees on either side, and then buildings that align to reinforce this axis. It wasn't, of course, initiated all at once. This was a master plan to be followed in stages as each building alongside the mall was constructed. So in 1936, you would see something like this, where the central axis is there, but there are these buildings still encroaching upon uh, that axis. But this would have been the extent of the mall uh, dictated by the Macmillan plan by those two architects and landscape architect. There with the buildings disturbing the plan, two of which would eventually become eliminated, one of which the Smithsonian Castle in the back, which remains there to this day. And the way they defined it, the way to define this piece of ground uh, that would become the National Mall was by a center line. A center line from the Capitol building to the Washington Monument, and then a 450 foot setback from that center line. Now this first became contested with the Department of Agriculture Administration building uh, around 1905. This was when the, the plan was either gonna happen or it was gonna be contested. And in fact, it was contested. The engineers in charge of the project cited the building entirely within that 450 foot setback. In fact, it was 300 foot. And they don't tell the architects this at all. They just go ahead with the building, start building the foundations uh, at this 300 foot line. And so the architects get word of this and they're entirely furious. Uh, they're mad that their plan is being compromised by these engineers who have disrespected their setback. And they, they kind of follow the chain of command, figuring out who approved this, who approved the plan, the 450 foot setback to be ignored. And what they find out is it's Theodore Roosevelt. It's the president of the United States who visited the site with the engineers and was assured by the engineers that 300 foot would be wide enough for anything. This is the reasoning they give. And this is critical because it demonstrates the different value systems that each profession projects upon the ground. The engineers clearly understood the mall in functional terms. They were interested in what kinds of activities would be possible within that strip of ground. And so for them, 300 foot seemed entirely satisfactory because as they said, it would be wide enough for anything. The architects, on the other hand, were deeply invested in the proportional relationships between the buildings that lined either side of the mall, as well as the Capitol building and the length of this axis, the width of the, the mall. All of these proportional relationships were what the architects were really concerned with, not the function of what would be possible within the strip of ground. So for them, to encroach upon the 450 foot setback would be to entirely compromise the scheme. So Daniel Burnham, who is the, the kind of head of this committee, uh, calls an emergency meeting with James Wilson, who is in charge of the Department of Agriculture building that's encroaching upon the mall, as well as the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. And at the meeting, Daniel Burnham lays out his reasoning for why this is inappropriate. He says, we propose a great open vista, and that vista is the great architectural feature if we may speak of landscape work as architectural. The center is to be grass, like a green carpet with roadways on each side, overhung by trees. The width of the mall from building to building is a little greater than the length of the capital, as it should be. The mall buildings form the architectural lines which lead up to the capital. If the mall were short, a narrow parkway 200 feet in width could be made, but such a narrow parkway would appear mean and insignificant in a park of the length and magnitude of the, National, of the Washington Mall. And here you can see that sort of distinction. And so this is a critical moment. The President of the United States now as the supreme authority has to make a decision. Does he affirm the engineers? And keep in mind, there's already money put into the project. They've already put the foundations into the earth. Does he keep with this plan, go with the engineers, go with the functional perspective, or does he take away those foundations and reconstruct the building according to the architect's plans? And this is what President Roosevelt says. 
Although the architect has not shown consideration for material things, this matter is very important in the after effect on the landscape. And as I think him more capable of judging what these effects will be than we are, I believe it will be better to trust his judgment. If you don't object, and he's speaking to Secretary Wilson here, we will give way to him. So this, of course, is a huge win for the architects. And the Department of Agriculture building is moved to its appropriate setback. And maybe more importantly for our purposes, the architect's authority over the ground is confirmed on a national stage. So here you can see where the Department of Agriculture was eventually moved off that 450-foot setback. And if you could imagine the ramifications that would have taken place had it not been moved today. So here is the mall we all know. And if you can see on the left-hand side that brick building, which is the Smithsonian Castle, the engineers were uh, proposing that their building would align with the Smithsonian Castle. This would have set a precedent for all of the mall buildings that would have encroached uh, basically onto those groves of trees. And so the mall would just spin this little strip of ground. Here again is a, an image from 1942 looking the opposite way. And so in this case, the Department of Agriculture building is in the lower right-hand corner. And somewhere buried beneath that grove of trees in the lower right-hand corner are the original foundations for this building. But what I want to dwell on for a little bit uh, is the idea that each profession projects its own value system onto the ground. This is a problem that we addressed in my seminar, where we took uh, all of these words, all these terminologies that seem related to ground, but are at the same time shifting within the discourse, and we began to map them. So as you can see, there are in fact a wide range of terms and conceptions of ground, and this is the very first day of the seminar. Uh, the kids show up and I say, okay, everyone gets four of these words and your only assignment is to go home, look up the definitions for each word and print them out. And once you have them printed out, just underline or highlight a particular part of the definition that might distinguish that ground term from other terms, right? And so they do this and they come back with things like this. Uh, and what you find is somewhat surprising. A word like turf in its first definition has uh, an entirely material and physical connotation. The upper stratum of soil bound by grass and plant roots into a thick mat. But if you go down to its fourth definition, it takes on more of a social connotation. A territory considered by a teenage gang to be under its control. Or the definition of yard, this was somewhat surprising. To see that yard can only exist when it's adjacent to a building an outdoor area next to a building, uh, the grounds of a building, an area set aside for business activity. Well, I guess the fourth one doesn't, I don't know why they highlighted set aside. But in general, we were interested here in, in its connection to building, that the building itself played a role in the defining, the definition of ground or landscape. Uh, of course, the pictorial, the aesthetic, the visual is what's really highlighted within the definition of this term. And so they did this exercise and they came back and we tried to organize these terms into some kind of map. So here we all are with our definitions taped up on the whiteboard in the classroom upstairs. And we started to form certain categories, the political, the social, the economic. It was something like one of those uh, crazy string maps you see in a crime movie where the lead character is trying to connect all of the dots. Uh, and we had some of the categories in mind before we started, but as we did the map, we had to invent new categories for terms that didn't necessarily fit with any of, within any of our preconceived uh, groups. And it was an entirely useful exercise that was eventually synthesized into a more coherent version, like this. Uh, and here you see some of the ground terms reflect architectural qualities. This would be plinth or foundation, or economic connotations like property and land. And now, many of these terms could be in multiple categories, so the map isn't absolute. But nonetheless, the exercise revealed the contradictions and differentiations that are built into the discourse on ground. And to make this point more explicitly, I want to talk about two particular terms and the connotations associated with them. And those are landscape and site. I think there's a tension between these two terminologies that is critical to our discussion. So when we think of landscape, we might think of an image like this. 
This is Alfred Bierstadt's Hetch Hetchy Canyon, a painting done in 1890. And this is uh, the Hetch Hetchy Canyon, by the way, is in Yosemite National Park. It has all the traits that we might ascribe to landscape, a continuous ground that extends as far as the eye can see, with no divisions, no boundaries imposed by the social order. And now, to be clear, the, the extent to which 19th century and even 20th century Americans understood landscape to be natural is an entirely different discussion. I tend to come at these issues from a historian's perspective. And so the question of whether or not something called nature actually exists isn't so important. Uh, because no matter what ontological conclusion you want to draw, the fact remains that past generations agreed that there was something called nature. And their shared faith in this concept, uh, it affected the way they lived their lives on the macro scale and even on the micro scale. But for our purpose, the nature question isn't really what's at stake at all. Instead, the important point I want to make here is that when we think of ground as being landscape, we assume it to be continuous, undivided, and complete. Or we might think of an image like this. This is Piedmont Park in Atlanta. It's a couple of blocks from where I used to live while I was doing my dissertation at Georgia Tech, uh, designed by the Olmsted brothers in the late 19th century. And again, the landscape takes its form as a continuous, complete ground. And we can contrast these landscapes with an image like this. This is back in North Carolina, where I'm from. And I would call this a site rather than a landscape. The important differences are that this ground relies on the definition of boundaries. In this case, property boundaries, legal setbacks. In contrast to landscapes which are continuous, sites are bounded, contained. But they are also incomplete. And so here you see this perfectly flattened piece of ground, and no one would come across this and say, OK, that's a finished product. Instead, you would expect that the, devel the developer is going to come back and build another one of these terrible houses there. So again, I want to reiterate this distinction between the continuity, the completeness of landscape on the one hand, and the discreteness, the boundedness, and the incomplete qualities of site. I would also suggest this difference is incredibly important. But contrary to popular belief, I don't think the difference is absolute or even stable or embedded within the ground itself. Instead, these are ideological frameworks that are projected onto the ground. And as such, any given landscape is vulnerable to being recast as a site and transformed. So if we return to the Alfred Bierstadt painting of the Hetch Hetchy Valley, then we can see an example of how the tension between landscape and site converge. Here's a photograph of the same landscape that Bierstadt is painting. So this is a painting of this, uh, taken probably in the early 20th century. And around the time this photograph is taken, this landscape's completeness was called into question. The city of San Francisco identified the Hetch Hetchy Valley as a potential site for a reservoir and dam. Uh, and this reservoir and dam was intended to provide water to the greater San Francisco Bay Area. The proposal, as you can imagine, it incited intense debate among the design professions. The engineers viewed this, the valley as a site for infrastructural production. So they argued in favor of building the dam and reservoir. Architects and landscape architects, on the other hand, spoke out against the project. So Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., who was part of that Macmillan Commission that designed the National Mall, wrote this editorial condemning the project. And what he says uh, is that the best views of the valley are unquestionably those obtained from the level of the valley floor at a short distance from the base of the cliffs looking up. So his entire argument rests on this premise that the best views are taken from the valley floor. And in fact, this is exactly how Albert Bier Alfred Bierstadt paints it from the valley floor. Now, if you were to flood the valley floor and make that the reservoir, this view is lost forever. And so in his conclusion, Olmsted states that the United States deliberately undertook to preserve the scenery of the Yosemite National Park, intact for the enjoyment of all future generations. The people of the United States are not yet so poor that they cannot afford to persevere in this purpose. To use the Hetch Hetchy as a San Francisco reservoir site would, to be, would be to abandon that purpose by indirection and would establish a precedent for abandoning the purpose of any and every park in case it conflicts with any considerable utilitarian interest. 
But within the increased industrialization and infrastructural production of the early 20th century, you might be able to guess which side won out. So here you see the O'Shaughnessy Dam, which took uh, almost a decade to build. And if you can believe it, this is a slap in the face to architects and landscape architects. The dam is named after its chief engineer. But like, all, like the conflict over the National Mall, this was a jurisdictional battle that hinged on competing conceptions of ground and its relationship to human activity. Perhaps the most generally contested area of jurisdiction between the design professions during the early 20th century was the city at large. So here you see two of the most significant American city planning projects of the early 20th century. On the top is the Macmillan Plan for Washington, D.C., which we've talked about already. And on the bottom is Daniel Burnham's plan for Chicago. In both cases, architects were assumed to be the rightful authorities on matters of city planning. Yet as the 20th century went on, this area of jurisdiction would gradually slip away from architects. And since we're in Los Angeles, I thought I'd give you an example of how jurisdictional battles shaped LA. Uh, in the 1920s, the Olmsted brothers, this is the same Olmsted that helped design the National Mall and pinned that editorial in Hetch Hetchy Valley. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. and his half-brother John Charles Olmsted were hired by the Los Angeles City of Commerce to produce a comprehensive plan for the city. Uh, this was after decades of explosive growth and the city's leaders were concerned about the utter lack of public parks. The Olmsteads had built a national reputa reputation for designing urban parks like the one I showed in Atlanta. And so uh, the city leaders of Los Angeles were hoping to bring that expertise to reimagine their city. And they did so in working with a St. Louis firm as well. So they spent several years uh, studying the city and making plans. And here what you see is an image from their 1930 proposal entitled Parks, Playgrounds, and Beaches for the Los Angeles Region. Now among the recommended improvements that, Olmsted, that the Olmsteads outline are nine elongated parkways. So what you see in green there were existing parks, and what you see in red were the Olmsteads proposals. There's three new parks oriented on an east-west axis and six oriented on a north-south axis. But in addition to parks, they were also aiming to address a problem specific to Los Angeles, which is flooding. Now, since we rarely get any rain, we don't often think of flooding as being a problem in Los Angeles. But the location of the city uh, at the base of a mountain range creates severe flooding problems, or at least did in the early 20th century, as you can see from these images. The historian Mike Davis has even argued that our geographical condition produced the worst flood and debris problems of any major city in the Northern Hemisphere. So these are from 1938, which was uh, an especially bad flood. And the most vulnerable areas to severe flooding like this were those immediately adjacent to the LA River, which at that time was still a natural channel flowing through the city. And so the Olmsted solution to this problem was really simple. They argued that the land on either side of the LA River should be declared what they called hazard zones. And this meant that they couldn't be developed for private industry. Instead, these would become lush greenways that would extend throughout the city. And simply by regulating the land use, the planners argued, major flooding problems could be prevented. Yet, as you all probably know, living in Los Angeles, none of these recommendations uh, were executed. We don't have any of the parks that are suggested here in red. And in fact, their zoning approach to the LA River was entirely ignored. Instead, what you get is a, I'll put this in quotes, a solution proposed by the Army Corps of Engineers. And this solution is discussed in Mike Davis's book, Ecology of Fear. He says, the opposing solution was to deepen an armor, that is pave, a narrow width of the river's channel in order to flush storm runoff out of the city as efficiently as possible, and thus allow extensive industrial development within the floodplain. And so here's the choice. Regulate development through zoning, and don't allow industry to creep onto the areas immediately adjacent to the river, or let industry do whatever it wants and just pave the river. As you all know, they did the latter. And so in 1938, the Army Corps of Engineers began the arduous task of deepening the river's bed 
widening its channel, and paving its banks. And today, I think we can interpret the paved riverbed as a monument that represents a cultural shift, a shift in values within the United States. Like the man-made reservoir and dam at the base of the Hetch Hetchy Valley, the paved channel cutting through the heart of Los Angeles is the product of a new modernized society, one that valued large-scale engineering projects over the preservation of America's natural landscapes. But it also reflects the outcomes of jurisdictional competition over the ground. Had landscape architects or architects been in charge of addressing the planning of Los Angeles and its, and its flooding problems, then we would likely be living in an entirely different kind of urban environment. So these examples give you a general sense of how I approach the jurisdictional conflicts between and among the design professions that have shaped both the built environment as well as these jurisdictional conflicts have also shaped the modern trajectories of each individual design discipline. And so here you see a, a diagram I've cr created to, to show how they split off. It could have been done slightly differently. I've constructed it according to professional organizations. So at each one of these splits, there is a new professional organization, one or more, being created. So in the 1850s, you have the American Society of Civil Engineers, as well as the AIA. And then in 1899, the American Society of Landscape Architects, followed by the American City Planning Institute in 1917. And by the 1930s, you don't have this fluidity, this blurring of boundaries between disciplines, but instead you have four parallel professions uh, kind of competing over jurisdictional territories. And what I've tried to do in my own research and writing is to trace the origins of these modern professions in order to understand how certain jurisdictional territories were claimed and how knowledge was distributed. But as I said in the beginning, in regard to Morris Hickey Morgan translating Vitruvius, origin stories are never really about the past. And so my own interest in learning how the professions split off from one another stems from a contemporary anxiety about the ground. Over the past two decades, we've seen numerous designers calling for a hybridization of architecture, landscape, and urban design. This trend is reflected in landform urbanism as well as landform building. And generally speaking, the two related camps represented by these two publications here argue that landscape is a productive metaphor for designing buildings and cities. They argue for continuity and the blurring of site boundaries and edges. Instead, a building flows seamlessly into a landscape, which flows seamlessly into the city. This approach is reflected in numerous publications, as well as individual design projects, some of which are built, others of which exist only in renderings. But this blurring of expertise, or this hybridization of practice, raises a lot of questions about the ways in which knowledge is distributed across the design professions. For instance, if we really took this trend seriously, it would likely prompt an entirely new system of education, accreditation, and licensure. In other words, it would undo an entire century's worth of professional individuation. Interestingly, an alternative approach has emerged in parallel to landscape urbanism and landform building. And instead of drawing upon the metaphor of landscape and its continuity, this other approach might be said to draw upon the metaphor of site. As you'll remember from earlier, the major distinction I've tried to draw between landscape and site is this difference between continuity, unboundedness on the one hand, versus containment and discreteness on the other. And so one of the main proponents of this discrete approach is Pierre Vittorio Aurelli, who has written this book, The Possibility of an Absolute Architecture. And in the introduction to his book, he defines exactly what he means by absolute. Absolute is intended to reflect the individuality of architectural form when that form is confronted with the environment in which it is conceived and constructed. To connect this position with my earlier discussion of jurisdiction, Aureli seems to be arguing that architects should firm up the perimeter boundaries of the discipline as a political strategy. And so within this book, he discusses a series of projects that illustrate the ways in which discreteness can function as an architectural strategy. And I want to give you just one of those examples, which is the Mesian plinth. Here you see the new National Gallery. And what you see is a constructed ground 
which is distinct from both the architectural form as well as the surrounding ground of the city. There it is from the front. You can also see the same technique tested in this unbuilt project in Cuba for a Bacardi office building or the Barcelona Pavilion. And what this technique does is emphasize the discreteness of an individual site. Here, Mies is forcing us to recognize the legal boundaries that define sites within the city. And I'll give you his interpretation of the Miesian plinth. This is what Aureli says. By putting emphasis on the building site, the plinth inevitably makes the site a limit for what it contains. Moreover, the way the plinth reorganizes the connection between a building and its site affects not only one's experience of what is placed on the plinth, but also, and especially, one's experience of the city that is outside the plinth. One of the most remarkable things felt by anyone climbing a Mies plinth, whether in New York or Berlin, is the experience of turning one's back to the building in order to look at the city. Suddenly, and for a brief moment, one is estranged from the flows and organizational patterns that animate the city, yet still confronting them. Suddenly, and for a brief moment, one is estranged from the flows and organizational patterns that animate the city, yet still confronting them. And so I think you can see this, especially in the Seagram Building in New York. When I was in school, there was this cliche going around that Mies created the plaza in front of the Seagram Building so that you could stand back and admire his architecture. Um, but that's actually not what you, you feel at all when you're on, on site at the project. If you visit this building, uh, what you see is really what Aureli describes. This constructed plinth separates you from the city, and through that separation allows you to see the city with new eyes. And this effect relies entirely upon the discreteness of Mises' site relative to the city at large. So important are the constructed grounds of Mises' work that when you buy little souvenirs of his projects, they often include the ground. So here you see the plinth of the Seagram included with these souvenirs, or the Lego version of the Barcelona Pavilion. And what you see is that they've not only included Mises' constructed ground, but also the existing ground of the city, which is shown here in beige. Because it's this distinction between the private site and the public street or sidewalk that is central to the ways in which Mises' work functions within the urban environment. And so what we arrive at is a polarity. On the one hand, there is landscape urbanism and landform building, where jurisdictional boundaries are to be erased so that designers can operate in a blurred professional territory. And on the other hand, its exact opposite is Aureli's argument for discreteness, which emphasizes the importance of boundaries and limit conditions. So I want to conclude tonight by showing uh, two contributions from this journal that I edited, published in the latest edi edition of Off Ramp. Uh, and I think they reflect these two polarities between continuity and discreteness, but at the same time, they move the conversation forward. In particular, I want to talk about an interview I did with Tom Wiscombe, who is chair of the BARC program here, and some student work from the Spring Studio taught by Florencia Pita, where they were looking at the LA River as a site for architectural design. So we'll start with Florencia Pita's Spring Studio, entitled Water Matters. And this is a studio that addressed the revitalization of the LA River. By itself, I think this decision to focus architectural design on the river is a provocation. As discussed earlier, the river was a site for jurisdictional competition in the early 20th century, when the Olmsted brothers presented their plan for hazard zones around the river, uh, and that was pitted against the Army Corps of, of Engineers, who wanted to simply pave the channel. And so one might read Florencia's framing of this design studio around the river as an attempt to reclaim a jurisdictional territory for architects. And I really want to emphasize the radicality of this decision to work on the infrastructural scale. One might imagine that architects and landscape architects would simply just accept the idea that infrastructural plans are going to be developed by city planners and civil engineers. And then we would focus our energies on infilling these urban frames. But the work of this studio entirely rejects that premise. And instead, it subsumes the river, and in doing so, the infrastructural scale within the architect's jurisdiction. 
Now, as most of you are probably aware, the city of Los Angeles is actively pursuing a plan to revitalize the river. And among the parties involved are architects like Frank Gehry, Cyark's own Euler Wu Collaborative. Uh, there are also landscape architects like Mia Lair, and of course, the Bureau of Engineering. So I'm sure there's gonna be complex jurisdictional dynamics uh, over the ground that will develop in the coming decade or so. But this team is working on a master plan. And the studio organized by Florencia Pita is really working only on a particular section of the river, the section between the first and fourth street bridges. Even so, this area that they've taken on is much larger than any ordinary architectural site. And the techniques that the students have employed, I think, emphasize continuity rather than discreteness. By the way, I had several of these students in my Theories of Ground seminar that was running in parallel. So there were several productive discussions about how the material we were covering in my seminar related to the work they were doing in studio. This student, McConaughey, for instance, was in uh, my seminar. And in this student's work, you can see a painterly approach that operates on the scale of landscape, emphasizing continuity, but it does so in a way that makes no reference to natural landscaping. Instead, the project is executed with an architectural material palette. Here again, the relationship to painting. I think Gerhard Richter's scraped paintings were a specific point of reference. And what this technique produces is a composition that is simultaneously both abstract and figural. It allows students to explore notions of grain and cross grain relative to the surrounding urban fabric. Now, if we want to contrast that with an entirely different approach, we should look at the work of the chair of the BARC program here, Tom Wiscombe. Uh, and when I interviewed Tom for the latest issue of Off Ramp, I really tried to get to the bottom of his relationship between building and ground. His is a body of work that I was entirely fascinated by since my arrival at SciArc. Uh, and what you see, especially in a project like this, is that the buildings tend to have their own ground. Here it's peeling up from the ground of the city and emphasizing its autonomy from the city at large. And one of the first things that Tom brought up uh, about his idea of ground is this notion that architecture might function as a world unto itself. So he says, if architecture is a world, that means it might have co a continuous boundary, like a planet, let's say, versus a landscape. So in this statement, he's arguing for discreteness rather than continuity. Instead of blurring the boundary between the private and the public, he's arguing to emphasize this division. And here you can see there's a clear difference between the ground which belongs to his building and the ground which belongs to the city at large. The more we talked about this relationship within the interview, uh, he turned to a strategy of deferral. He says, in the office, when we design a project, we bracket out ground altogether at least initially. We don't index the ground, manipulate it, or even talk about it. It remains in a state of deferral. So in this sense, there is a prioritization of the formal agenda for the architectural object, and only after this object has been configured does he turn to the task of landing the building onto the ground. Here's a diagram of Wiscombe's published in Project Journal a couple of years ago. And this diagram lays out a series of possible strategies for landing an architectural object. On the top, he says that if architecture equals landscape, then that fusion undermines the objecthood. And so that gets a sad face. So he's clearly positioning himself against the landscape model for architecture. And instead, below that dashed line, he proposes three possible solutions which get a happy face. Uh, my favorite is the, the ground object in the middle, where there is an architecturalization of ground the ground itself becomes architecturalized and is clearly different than the ground of the city. So again, these two bodies of work that were published in the off-ramp journal emphasize this polarity between continuity on the one hand and discreteness on the other. But in both cases, I think these, uh, these students of Florencia Pita and Tom Wiscombe and his firm, they expand the architect's jurisdiction to include ground. And in that way, they are similar to the architects of the Macmillan Commission. They demand that the ground be included within the architect's purview. They demand that that is their expertise. They have authority 
to make decisions about how not only buildings are constructed, but how the ground is constructed. But in doing so, neither accept the idea that architecture blurs into landscape design. Instead, both address ground in ways that are fundamentally architectural. And what I've tried to do tonight is to show that history can rub up against design agendas in a productive way. From my perspective, tracing the history of jurisdictional boundaries within the design profession provides a compelling context for framing contemporary design debates, especially this debate over the relationship between building and ground. Because ultimately, and this is something I'm a firm believer in, the social dynamics of practice become materialized in the real world. That is to say, the ways in which we choose to construct disciplinary boundaries has a physical impact on the built environment. And I think the examples of the National Mall, the Hetch Hetchy Valley, and the LA River illustrate this point. But my research is really not intended to give you a right or wrong way to approach the design of ground. I'm certainly not arguing for either discreteness or continuity. I actually think there's fruitful territory to explore within each of these ideas. And I'm a firm believer that the historian or the theorist's job is not to provide answers at all. Instead, my job is to direct attention to the right questions. So my goal here tonight has been to provide a historical context as well as vo a vocabulary so that we can sharpen the ways in which we think and talk about the relationship between building and ground. To frame it in terms of jurisdiction, I'm urging that architects reclaim the ground as a critical discussion within architectural practice. In Florencia Pita's studio, the ground itself becomes the project. By contrast, within Tom Wiscombe's work, ground or landing is often deferred until the architectural object has already taken shape. And there are differences between these two approaches that are significant. And I hope my discussion of landscape and site has helped illuminate those differences. But the most important point is that both bodies of work take a strong position on architecture's relationship to ground. In each case, ground is included within the architect's jurisdiction. And I would urge us all to defend this jurisdictional territory and continue questioning the ways in which our buildings engage in notions of site, landscape, and other manifestations of ground. Thank you. I'll take any questions or comments or rebuttals. Yeah. Oh, we got a, there's a microphone thing for some reason. Okay, hi. Hi. Uh, so, so I thought that was really, really interesting and, and you know, and, and this, this image is kind of like a great, uh, you know, works really well with your whole argument. I guess, uh, particularly in focusing on this kind of disciplinary boundary, something, something that really strikes me is there's a, a, the potential difference between architecture and particularly civil engineering and landscape in that this is a choice for architects. The idea of a treatment of the ground which is discrete and the creation of site or the kind of expansion of the building into a, a, a continuous sort of form. And I don't see that choice existing for landscape architecture or civil engineers whose work is always the ground. Uh, and landscape architects aren't constructing volumes to put on the ground, they're, they're constantly engaging with this, this medium. Uh, and, and I think that that's a kind of a, a fairly intense disciplinary difference when we when we talk about you know when we talk about this so I just wonder if how much that that's come up and when you when you talk about architecture re-engaging the ground as a part of its domain how that that plays out with uh, the kind of preeminence that that uh, you know where, where then is the place of landscape and civil engineering in that yeah I think that's a really good question um, I, you know I, I think there, to a certain extent, is a decision within landscape architecture, at least. I, I don't know about civil engineering. But within landscape architecture, you might think of the distinction between garden design and landscape design. A garden, by definition, comes from the kind of the root of guard, meaning it has to be bounded. 
And so uh, in my Theories of Ground seminar, we spent a whole class on the garden. And it's really defined by this boundary, whether it's a wall, whether it's a hedge, but some kind of delineation. Uh, and you can contrast the emphasis on garden design, say, in the early 20th century with uh, what they would call wild gardens, which are the sort of untamed, uh, entirely constructed, entirely artificial, but nonetheless have this uh, aesthetic of being untamed, being continuous. So within landscape architecture, I think there might be a similar dis distinction. Uh, but yeah, civil engineering, I don't know. I don't know that th these kinds of issues are really at the forefront of what they're thinking. And that speaks to the point that they're projecting an entirely different value system onto the ground and how they think of practice. But yeah, that's a great point to think about how each of the professions would even frame this kind of question for themselves. Uh, thanks for that. It's great. Um, so this might be a bit of a stretch of the imagination, but looking at the ground and how how architecture engages and interacts with that, uh, it led me to the question of, um, and this might not have happened yet because of technological difficulties, but how architecture can engage and interact with the sky above. Hmm. Uh, and I wanted to know your thoughts on that and any work that you know that engages that question. Yeah, so um, I'm working in a territory that I think is really exciting right now, not exciting because of me, but because, exciting because of the people I, I look up to. People like David Gisson comes to mind as someone who's trying to merge history with design. And so uh, I don't know exactly when he did this project, but at some point he was working on a project that would reimagine or reconstruct the uh, pollution that existed above the city of Pittsburgh in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, uh, all the industrial production would have created this pollution, and there's a speculative project that Gisson has done to reconstruct that, as, and he has these renderings which show the sky in a kind of perfectly formed cube of smoke or smog right above the city. Uh, that comes to mind initially as something dealing with the sky, uh, but also doing so, so in a way that merges history with design as a kind of research venue. Um, I think there certainly could be other uh, examples of that. There's, uh, yeah, I think that's a very fruitful line of research for sure. Hi. I as well also am grateful for your lecture and I enjoyed it. Um, what I found, the part of the lecture I found most exciting was when you started mentioning the Seagram building and Mies van der Rohe's uh, Barcelona Pavilion because I was really concerned that this ground condition is always going to be subservient to this architectural condition and then the jurisdictional division is going to amplify that subservience of the ground to whatever purpose is, is being claimed by it. So when you start talking about the Seagram building and the Barcelona Pavilion, the ground starts to have like a power of its own and that's done with the architect using it and that's, but like the same effect was happening in Beardstadt's painting when you left it alone. So I'm curious at, about how you acknowledge that in jur jurisdictional divisions that each architect might have a separate agenda with the ground, but the ground takes a, like a full full power over societal roles when when it has a a mass presence like in Manhattan when the entire condition is is simultaneous but then that also allows a singular effect like the Seagram building to have even more power because of its consistency or or like the LA river the reason it's so powerful is cuz the consistency in the basin and then it's this one strata that moves moves through it yeah, so um, I didn't give this lecture, but I did a couple of weeks ago for uh, some of the USC students on site. And what I did in that lecture is trace the role of ground from the 20th century. And what I think you find is there's one trend that's towards isolating building from grounds. So you can think of the elevated building of Bill Savoie or any, any number of buildings that elevate off the ground. And then I trace that to the post-war nomadic building of John Haydick's uh, architectural masks, which were meant to be transported across the ground. Or you can say uh, Rossi's Teatro del Mundo, which moves across the ground in a nomadic way. 
But in parallel to that, and this, this is where it gets to your question, there is another approach where ground becomes the project. And so you see this in Super Studios, Continuous Monument. You could see it in Eisenman's work pretty much from 1978 on. He is focusing explicitly on the ground as the project. Um, and that, that's where I think I would start to, to trace that lineage back. Uh, and so if you're going to trace landscape urbanism, uh, landform building, maybe you start with the kind of post-war projects that, where ground is the entire project, right? Maybe even ArchiZoom comes into the conversation, but certainly Peter Eisman's work uh, on the artificial excavations or Conoreggio, that's where ground itself takes priority over the object. And in fact, the object is entirely removed. And I see that as the corollary to Haydick or Rossi or even Archigram's Walking City, where the object's there, but the ground has been removed. So there's these funny things working in parallel. Um, hi, once again, uh, thank you. Um, I guess I have a question that's a little bit about private versus public and this question of access and the kind of language that's sometimes expressed um, by ground in, in forms of articulation that sort of insinuate whether or not this ground is for me or whether or not I can mm. walk on this ground or whether or not it's okay for me to sort of begin to engage a certain space or place. And even just like sort of looking at this, this image that's on the screen, um, you would have a very difficult time like yelling at people to stay off your lawn when it doesn't seem to be yours. And even looking at sort of suburban spaces where kind of, um, kind of these little kind of green uh, lawns or site conditions are often sort of fought over because they haven't explicitly been uh, bounded, let's say. So I guess my, my question would be, um, to, ha to what level does this kind of uh, dis discussion of articulation come to play? And whether or not that kind of access becomes something that's v like visibly or uh, visually discerned rather than explicitly sort of uh, expressed or forced by the ground. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if you walk downtown in Los Angeles, you'll periodically come across these little plaques built into the ground that say private property on the sidewalk. Private property, sort of, and whoever owns the building owns this piece of sidewalk. And I think that speaks to what you're talking about. Like, says who? I think these things are negotiable. Um, I mean, especially in sort of the times we're living in now. Uh, I live downtown, and last night, the sort of streets were negotiable to a certain extent. I live on Spring, and there were people sort of claiming that ground, the street, the public street as their own in a certain kind of political way. Uh, so I think that's absolutely at the heart of this question of site versus uh, landscape is the political ramifications of ground. And uh, like I said, I think everything's always negotiable. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs>